Well, good evening, everyone. We thank you for welcoming us in your home tonight, Wednesday night family training hour, Bible study. And I just want to speak to our children just for a moment, and then uh, we're going to pray, and then Brother Roger's going to come and share the Word of God with us in a Bible lesson. But boys and girls, thank you for uh, tuning in with us, joining with your family tonight. How important it is that we share the message of Jesus Christ. This week is called Holy Week. In the church, we uh, celebrate Palm Sunday, and then on Friday, we call it Good Friday, when Jesus died on the cross for us. And then Sunday is the most important day. It was the day Jesus rose from the dead, Resurrection Sunday. We call it Easter, but I like to call it Resurrection Sunday because Jesus lives, we live. But you know what, boys and girls, a lot of people in this world have not heard about Jesus. <clears throat> it's so important that we tell them, not be ashamed, not be afraid, but tell them about Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross to save us and to give us a home in heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I'm going to sing this little song, Everybody Ought to Know. And you, maybe you know it, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. He's the lily of the valley. <clears throat> He's the bright and morning star. And in the second verse is everybody ought to tell who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. The chorus answers it. Oh, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand. Everybody ought to know. Now, everybody ought to tell, everybody to tell, everybody ought to tell, everybody ought to tell who Jesus is. Everybody ought to tell, everybody ought to tell, everybody ought to tell who Jesus is. bright and morning star he's the fairest of ten thousand everybody ought to tell everybody ought to know let's pray Jesus Thank you for your everlasting love and mercy and grace. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and taking my place and our place and dying in our place for the sins that we've committed. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. And Jesus, may we share the good news of salvation with others, with our friends, with our family, with our loved ones with our neighbors. And Jesus, we ask you to heal tonight. Lord, before you died on the cross, you let them beat your back. And the Bible says that by your stripes we're healed. And Jesus, our nation needs healing tonight. Lord, there are many that are sick and 
There are many getting sick. And Lord, we ask for your healing for our nation tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and your grace. In your sweet name we pray. Amen. Now we want to turn service over to the man of God, Brother Roger, as he comes to share the word of God. Well, good evening again, everyone. It's good to be with you again, coming by means of uh, social media. And I trust that you've had a good day. And as we are going through this Holy Week, halfway through now, I pray that you would just, uh, you know, you just really focus on what all Jesus went through this week. For you and I, culminating in the crucifixion on Friday and then Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And we give him all praise and glory. Tonight, uh, the topic of my lesson tonight is two gardens, but actually there's going to be three gardens. So I want to read a passage of scripture in Matthew 26, verses 36 through 48. Of course, this is Jesus agonizing in the garden. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here, he here, and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and praying, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth pray, betray me. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. As Brother Cornett shared, this is Holy Week. Tomorrow being what many call Monday Thursday, Jesus is going to be betrayed. He put on trial, beaten and crucified. He's in the upper room with the disciples and they have had the Last Supper. Jesus has washed the disciples' feet and then took with him Peter, James, and John. And as they departed out of the upper room, and the Passover meal was finished, they sang a hymn. The Bible says that they sang a hymn, Matthew 26 and 30. And it's, it's a wonderful that they worshipped with a hymn. And a Passover meal always ended in singing three psalms. Notice noted as the Hallel, and that was from Psalms 116 through 118. Portions of that was the song that they were singing. And surely the words of these psalms ministered to Jesus as he sang them on the night before his crucifixion. And I challenge you tonight to, to look up and read Psalms 116 through 118. But when he came to Gethsemane, and that words of that song, that psalm was still fresh in his mind, and it was a, an appropriate description of how God would guide Jesus through this distress and suffering to glory. They went to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus tarried with them in the upper room. In John's writing, he 
penned the prayer. He, he gave the prayer that John recorded in John 14 to 17. But they came to the garden, and Jesus was in uh, much address. Now, the Mount of Olives of Gethsemane was, uh, there was a place just east of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Across from the ravine of the brook of Kidron, on the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives, you could look from the Mount of Olives and look over at the walls of Jerusalem and the eastern gate. And it was surrounded by ancient olive trees. I had the uh, opportunity in 2014 to, to go to Jerusalem, and those old olive trees and that Garden of Gethsemane, it just... Uh, it's just a surreal place. You could just feel the Spirit of God there. But Jesus began to be troubled and distressed, and he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Jesus knew what the Father's will was, yet he still endured this agony that he was going through. It was because Jesus was to be a sacrifice for sins, and he wasn't an unknowing sacrificial animal, nor was he a victim of circumstances. He, he resolved willingly to lay down his life. And it was not so much the horror of a physical torture that Jesus knew he was going to endure, but it was the spiritual terror of being made sin he who knew no sin, being made sin for you and I. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. For he had made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he was in such distress that he called out, Abba, Father. And Jesus didn't feel far from God the Father, he actually felt so close to him that he used Abba, the name, a child's familiar name for their, for their daddy. And he said, if you can take this cup away from me. You know, Jesus' prayer bound to, it was bound to stir God's heart. The Father did not take the cup from Jesus, but he gave him strength to endure what he was going to do, to drink the cup. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, the cup is a, a picture of wrath and judgment of God. In Psalm 75 and 8, it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and it poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof all of the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. So that even in the Old Testament, the cup was a picture of, of God's wrath and fury. But Jesus said, nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. He came to a point of decision in Gethsemane. And it wasn't that he decided not to, nor consented before, but he came to a point where he knew that he was going to drink the cup he decided once and for all to drink it at Gethsemane. The struggle of the cross was won at Gethsemane. Gethsemane, the place of crushing, has an important part in fulfilling God's plan of redemption. If Jesus failed here, he would have failed at the cross. But his success here in Gethsemane made the victory of the cross possible. If it were possible, Jesus wasn't asking for permission to let humanity perish in hell. He's asking the Father if there's any other possible way to save humanity other than the agony which awaits me at the cross. Let it be. Yet there was no other way. So Jesus went to the cross. The prayer of Jesus eliminates any other way of salvation. Only through the blood of Jesus can we be saved. If there was another way, his death would not have been necessary, and his prayer would not have been answered. And he said, not what I wish, 
but what you will. And he prayed this prayer three times. And some people are kind of critical of asking repeatedly when we go to God in prayer. Are you asking repeatedly? But Jesus prayed three times. But pray not what I will, but what you will is a power of great faith and trust in God. And he took with him three of his closest friends to to be with him during this time. And he came back and he found them sleeping. At this moment of turmoil and agony, Jesus was alone. His disciples gave him no support. They actually maybe failed Jesus at that point. But you know, it was the way it had to be, I guess. Jesus had to face the terror of the cross all alone. And he told him, he said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail because he had told him. He told him later on, he said, you'll deny me. Yet he encouraged the, him to victory knowing that the resources that he needed are found in watching and praying just like We're going through a trying time now. But watch and pray. The spiritual battle is often won or lost before the crisis comes. And he went away and prayed again the same words. Mark offers the same prayer in his writing. And he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. In Luke 22 and 44, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's a medical condition called hematidrosis, which actually blood can break through the capillaries and actually look like you're sweating blood. So Jesus was in such agony and, and turmoil that he actually began to I believe sweat drops of blood. And he went on and returned and he found them asleep. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still resting and sleeping? And he told them, Sleep on now. And they slept. He said, In effect, Go and have your sleep. I can watch. And he watched them while they slept. It is enough. We should not think that Jesus was angry or irritated because the disciples went to sleep on him. But I think what he was wanting, he was wanting the disciples to stand with him in prayer, not for his own sake, but for their benefit. Jesus could stand alone against the trial of the cross, but the disciples, they being without prayer, would not do this ordeal. Now I want to contrast two gardens, well actually three gardens. We've just been talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. But the Bible says in Genesis 2.8, at the beginning of time, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Man's existence began with God in a garden. A garden also awaits in man's destiny with garden. Destiny with God. And a garden experience in between makes it possible. We start with the Garden of Eden. But let me let me reiterate that again. Man's existence began in a garden. At the end of time, the new new heaven and new earth, some scripture refers to it as paradise, and paradise in the Greek can be translated in the English as a garden. So a garden awaits our final destiny with God, if we have that personal relationship with Him. And a garden experience 
in between these two makes that all possible. So scripture is placed between the, the bookends of two garden-like settings with another garden, a crucial garden setting, appearing in the middle of the Bible, using the other two as a singular purpose. The two gardens mentioned prominently, as like I said, is the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. God placed the first man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus went into Gethsemane to restore what the first man had lost. In 1 Peter 2 and 24, Who his own self by our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So the first Adam sinned in the garden. The last Adam took sin upon himself. The Garden of Eden had a tree of life, which man could have enjoyed forever, had he not broken the fellowship with God. The Garden of Gethsemane was a step toward the tree of death, the cross. By Adam's transgression, he forfeited his right to the tree of life and brought death to all mankind. But he who hung on the tree of Calvary conquered death, and by his glorious resurrection restored the tree of life to all who believe in him. The garden where Adam fell is gone. The garden of Eden is gone. But there is a glad day coming when he who suffered alone in Gethsemane will restore all things. The curse will be lifted from the earth, the animals will again be docile, as Isaiah wrote. The deserts will disappear. Isaiah penned that. The earth will yield her increase abundantly. And Jesus will be here personally to bless his people. Revelations in 21 and 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So how does what Adam lost, Jesus restored? So how would the story of Eden and Gethsemane, how does it, it still affects us today? Two gardens. Eden and Gethsemane provided the setting for two choices that brought opposite results. The Bible contrasts these two. and In fact, you, we face them today. In the Garden of Eden, Adam's choice to commit sin had the potential of bringing condemnation to, to everyone. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ's decision to die provided potential justification to everyone. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Adam would never have eaten the fruit, I don't believe, if he had known the consequences to himself and to his fellow man, to his race, on down through life. But he couldn't see the results. All he had was God's word and, and warning. But really, that's all, all we have, too. We have God's word that tells us consequences of our Failures and shortcomings are sins. Every day we walk in the gardens of decision. The two choices and the two gardens give us pause to consider our own decision today. The first Adam began life in a garden. The last Adam came near the end of his life in a garden. In Eden, Adam sinned. 
In Gethsemane, the Savior overcame sin. In Edom, Adam hid. In Gethsemane, the Lord boldly presented himself as his accusers came to arrest him. In Eden, Adam fell. In Gethsemane, Jesus conquered. Maybe you've never thought about the Bible in this story quite in this manner. But all of this culminates and comes to another conclusion in Revelation 22 when it describes a new heaven and a new earth. Another crucial Bible story like this. When Jesus had John to pen the words in Revelations and said, Behold, I make all things new. And you know, like Jesus in the garden, we can take God at His word even when it costs us dearly. Knowing that what little sacrifice we might make, the Father makes it worthwhile. Our choices can produce good beyond imagination. In a little bit of irony, it was in Eden where man received the kiss of life. When God formed man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed, and leaned down, and he breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So in Eden, the man received the kiss of life. Mankind returned the favor by giving Jesus through the person of Judas, the kiss of death in the Garden of Gethsemane. When they came to arrest him, Judas had worked it out, and he said that he would go up and give the one a kiss that they wanted him to arrest. He had sold him for 30 pieces of silver, and when they came into the garden, Judas ran up and gave Jesus a kiss, and they arrested him. Revelations 2 and 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we see in the first Eden, the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of life. In the final heaven, paradise, there will be a tree of life, a place of rest and refreshment where the righteous dead enjoy the glorious presence of God. In Revelation 21 and 4, God said that he would wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There will be no more pain, there will be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. He said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write, for these things are true and faithful. So just like... We've got two gardens here, contrasting two gardens. But we also have two choices. We have a choice to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, establish that personal relationship with Him. And then we're promised this, this home in heaven. Our name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you read the 22nd chapter of of revelations and when he talks a little bit about heaven and there may be trials and tribulations in this in this life but one day this is all going to be over and God has promised us a eternal home that we can be with him forever in a land of no mores no more pain no more separation no more death behold all things are going to be made new when you weigh those in the balance, it's a no-brainer to accept that salvation that Christ offered, the things he went through this week, this holy week, the beatings, the crucifixion. He did it all for you and I. Because of his great love, for each one of us. Let's pray.
God, it just, sometimes it's even just hard to read the story about the, the things that you endured this week. But God, we thank you for going to the cross and taking our sins upon you. I thank you for precious blood that you shed, that blood that, that washes us white as snow. I thank you that you offer forgiveness for our failures and shortcomings. And God, that you've promised us. We, I, we read the end of the book today, and what a glorious time that's going to be. And it's there for each one of us. Heaven was made for each one of us. But we have to accept that personal relationship that you offer. So my prayer tonight, that God, that you would just deal with hearts. If someone don't know you under the free part of sin, God, that the Holy Spirit would just minister their hearts. And Lord, just speak to them about what you have to offer for us, the benefits of this life in Christ. God, once again, we thank you for your sacrifice. And Father, we love you and we give you all praise and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.